Welcome to AP Biofarm with Dr. D. This is our second installment on the theory of evolution. And today we're going to be discussing the evidence for it. And I'm starting the presentation with the tree of life as we know it. And you see where we are right here in animals. We've branched off from archaea and bacteria. Archaea is the ancient bacteria. Bacteria here is the common everyday bacteria we know. So let's dive right into it. So what is the evidence for descent with modification or the overwhelming evidence for the theory of evolution? Uh, one is the time machine. We're able to go back in time by examining fossils and biogeography. Two would be comparative anatomy, noticing homology and structures among living organisms, as well as vestigial structures. Three would be uh, analogous structure, structures, which are evidence for convergent evolution. These are similar adaptations and evolutionary non-related um, creatures. Compare different embryology, which um, shows us how certain animals develop um, early in development. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, molecular biology, which is comparing the sequences in the DNA RNA or protein molecules between different um, organism species. And finally, um, direct observations of evolution as a process. Um, evolution is an ongoing process and observations of this process are evidence for the theory of evolution. So let's talk about fossils first. You know a lot about fossils. Fossils are um, the preserved remains of organisms. Fossils can be found in different layers of sediment rock, and the deeper you dig, of course, uh, the more ancient these fossils are, so I'm not going to be talking much about it, except to make you aware that not all living organisms fossilize and preserve well. So we do have uh, gaps in our knowledge about the evolutionary history of life. Um, so how are fossils evidence for evolution? Um, well, the deeper you dig, right, so um, the uh, deeper the sediment layer is, the more ancient um, that fossil is. And fossils are evidence for um, the fact that species have become extinct. And if you compare the structure of these extinct species to modern -day species, you can see how related we are because there's an, uh, homologous structures. You can also follow uh, how new groups, currently living organisms, have developed, have evolved. We can see the changes within groups over time. And I'm gonna remind you of what we saw in the stickleback movie of the fossilized remains of the stickleback fish. Fossils can be dated um, several different ways. Um, so fossils are a time machine because they help us like walk back in time and um, reconstruct the evolutionary history um, on earth. And they can be dated um, in several different ways. One of the ways you already know, it's the age of the rocks, the sediment layer in which the fossils can be found. Geographical location also help date uh, rocks. Geologists know simply that certain locations have certain age of rocks. Isotopes or radioisotope dating is something that you might or may not be familiar with. Um, it basically measures the ratios between normal elements and um, isotopes, which are rarer. And because isotopes um, have a known decay rates, it can help scientists date um, the particular fossil. And one of the most commonly used isotopes is carbon because carbon, you know, we're carbon-based life forms. Carbon is in all uh, organic molecules. So the normal is a carbon-12 isotope and then uh, carbon-13 or carbon-14 can be used to um, determine the age of a particular fossil. Fossils are also extremely important because they can document important transitions. And one of the most important transitions in the history of uh, life on Earth is the transition from land, from sea to land. Oh, I should have not said from land to sea, it's from sea to land, because life first uh, emerged in the sea and the colonization of land um, by plants, anima, animals was an important historical um, feature in um, the history of life on Earth. So the most famous fossil is one of the first transitional fossils to be discovered, Tiktaalik, 
uh, and dictalic. This is basically an artist's rendering of the fossil. Um, the artist of the lead, this is what the animal presumably looked like. Had features both of a, of a sea animal and a land animal and documents the transition from sea to land, okay? And if you weren't sure why evolution started, here's a funny cartoon um, explaining it. So what is biogeography? Um, biogeography is basically the geographic distribution of species, both living and uh, fossilized remains. And it provides evidence for evolution because we know that earth continents were formerly united in a single large continent, single land, large land mass called Pangaea. But ever since then, they have separated and drifted apart. And by determining what kind of fossils and what kind of organisms live in the different continents today, we can actually, again, use that as a time machine to figure out um, what happened in the distant um, past. Um, so now we're to number two category of evidence, comparative anatomy. So comparing the structure of animals is comparative anatomy. Um, and this has, this has led to the discovery of homologous structures. So parts of the body that are similar, but have different functions. And I would like to draw attention to you to this. This is um, the anatomy of a human arm, a cat's leg, a whale flipper, and a bat's wing. So imagine the different functions a human arm has, a cat's leg, a whale flipper and a bat wing. The bat uses it to fly. The whale uses the flipper to swim. Cat, of course, uh, moves on all fours. Human arm has a completely different function, right? And I want you to notice the bones. All of these critters have a humerus depicted here in purple. They have two bones, the radius and the ulna depicted in um, blue and whatever that color is. Um, the carpal bones, the little bones um, that are connecting the humerus and ulna to the metacarpals. The metacarpals depicted in red and the phalanges depicted in tan. And I want you to notice that there's five phalanges and five metacarpals in all of these. All of these organisms have one humerus, one radius, one ulna. They have the carpal bones, they have the five metacarpals, and they have the five phalanges. So the number of bones is the same. The type of bones is the same. The way in which they are ordered is the same. The humerus is connected to the radius and the ulna, the radius and the ulna are connected to the carpal, carpal is connected to the metacarpal, and so on. Now, what is different? The difference is the size of the bones, right? So you see how the phalanges of a whale flipper are so much longer than that of a cat. And the carpals in a bat wing are so much um, thinner and longer than the, um, sorry, the metacarpals, than the metacarpals of, of a human arm or a cat or even a whale flipper. <coughs> so, this is evidence that all of these organisms descended from the same, had the same ancestor at some point um, in the distant past, the same ancestor, but they have descended with modifications. Now we're different. There's something in common because we all have the same ancestor that had a humerus, a radius, an ulna, and so on and so on. But see how each of these structures is now different because they have different functions. So this is evidence for descent with modification. And you see the modifications right here, right? You see how the humerus of a whale is very different from the humerus of a cat and very different from the humerus of a bat because these structures have different functions, okay? Vestigial structures are another uh, piece of evidence um, and anatomical evidence that, um, are used for, um, to support that we're all descended from a common ancestor. And vestigial structures are basically structures that we still have, but they serve no apparent purpose in an organism that has them. And an example uh, of this is 
that males have muscles that can move their external ears and you do too, right? But most people never learn to use them and ear wiggling doesn't really make any difference to our survival. So why are they still there, these muscles? Well, they remain there because we inherited them from a common ancestor with um, mammals that do use uh, them and where wiggling your ears is, is an advantage, is an adaptation. They haven't disappeared because even though they don't come for any advantage, they also don't come for any disadvantage. So it's just remnants of a distant past when we had an ancestor where moving your external ears was an adaptation. Another example of vestigial structures is the pelvis in the femur in humans. So the pelvis is attached uh, to the vertebrae here and um, the femur bones are your thigh bones. Um, and you can see them right here, right? So what do we use them for? Well, we use them to walk. We walk on two legs, right? And four-legged animals also use them to walk. But what use does the whale have for them? The whale has a femur and a pelvis. And they're very um, much, the femur is very small, but it is there. And that is evidence that the whale and the human, as a matter of fact, the whale and the four-legged hoof animals are closely related. They have a common ancestor in the distant past. And this is one of the most interesting things actually in evolution that believe it or not, remember how I told you that life originated in the sea and then moved to land, land was colonized. Well, I like to tell this story about whales. Well, whales were sea animals. Then they went back to land, right? They were part of the animals, part of the living organism that colonized land, right? And they came to land, they saw, they didn't like, Guess what? They went back to the sea. Now, why did they go? How do we know this? Well, we know this because all the evidence points to the fact that whales are most closely related to hoofed four-legged animals. Okay. So they're very closely related to them, which means that whales one had four legs, were on land, but then went back to the sea. Essentially, they didn't like it and went, so they went back to the sea. Um, Snakes have vestigial femurs, right? Snakes no longer have legs. Snakes evolved from four-legged animals. Do you have a tail? We no longer have tails, right? So the spinal cord, and we have a hooked coccyx, right? So which is the tailbone. We have a tailbone, right? But we don't have a tail. So why do we still have a tailbone? because it's a remnant of a distant past when our ancestor had a tail. And I'm showing you this <laughs> gross picture here only uh, just to gross you out. That's no other reason, right? So um, occasionally human babies are born with a tail, okay? But this is not really a true tail. It's simply caused by a lack of apoptosis in a certain tissue during development. And that tail is really easily removed uh, by a surgery. Okay, then there are all these lizards that live um, in caves. They still have eyes, but those eyes are non-functional. They're sightless eyes. So what are they evidence for? Well, they're evidence for the fact that this lizard and lizard that has eyes have a common ancestor in the distant past that had eyes, which were seeing eyes. Okay, now we're to number three. Number three is convergent evolution. Um, how do we know um, about a convergent evolution? Well, we know because of analogous structures. Now, those are structures which are similar, but they're present in unrelated organisms. And these organisms develop those structures independently because of fit of an organism to its environment. And the best example are wings. The wings of a bat, the wings of a bird, and the wings of an insect. Now, these three groups of animals are very much unrelated. And even the structures themselves are, they're not similar anatomically, but they do have a similar shape and a similar function. And that function is to fly, to be suspended in air. These structures are called analogous structures. So the feathers of the wing, um, the shape of an insect um, wing or the wing of a bat are actually anatomically very differently, different. 
yet they're analogous because they have the same function. Okay, another example is the sugar glider in Australia and the flying squirrel. They don't really flying, they're just gliding, but they have these like um, similar shapes that allow them to glide in the air. Okay, so just remember there is a difference between homology and analogy. Homology is when the structures have different function, but they have the same structure. So same structure, different function, that is homology. Same function, different, fun different structure, that is analogy. So the bad wing, the butterfly wing, the bird wing have the same function, but they have a different structure. That's analogy. Homology is when they have the same structure, but different function, okay? Embryological development is another evidence for evolution. When you compare um, how animals develop, you will see that in the very, very early stages, if um, you were to look at a very early stage of embryonic development, the embryos look the same. You can't tell human from a pig or from a tortoise or from a lizard. And only during later stages of development, you can see now a distinctiveness and um, the shape and form of the developing embryo. And that is evidence that, that's not the only evidence, but there's just the visual evidence that um, many animals develop in a very, very similar way, um, especially early in development. Homologous molecules is another piece of evidence. If we were to compare DNA sequences or amino acid sequences and proteins, uh, we can actually determine how closely related organisms are, and we can determine this ancestry, this uh, relatedness of organisms. And here's an example. The amino acid sequence of cytochrome C um, in humans and in chimps, and cytochrome C is basically the last protein in the electron transport chain. That's the one that is gonna hand um, the electrons to oxygen, um, is differs by a single amino acid, one amino acid difference, okay? And finally, we have direct observations of species changing. Um, we have the direct observation of animals evolving. Um, the most um, easily observable is the presence of drug-resistant infections, unfortunately. So bacteria adapts to the use of antibiotics, and um, this is actually a huge problem for human health. Flu vaccine not being very helpful every year because the virus mutates. The Galapagos finches, which we're gonna talk about soon. The rock pocket mouse is another activity where we're going to be exploring um, evolution, evidence for evolution um, based on observing the process of evolution. Tuskless elephants is another example. Because humans have harvested, um, have killed elephants and harvested their tusks for the value of ivory. Um, now elephants are being born and uh, without tusks. Also smaller fish. Because of regulation, fishing regulations that uh, fish have to be a certain size to be harvested. So if you harvest fish that is small, smaller than a certain size, it needs to be returned to the sea. And that is done to protect the populations of fish. So if you harvest a fish that is small in size, that means that's a, um, a juvenile fish that needs to be returned back to the sea so it'll have the chance to reproduce before you harvest it. So fishermen return smaller fish uh, back to the sea because of these regulations. And these regulations make sense, but as a result, fish are now smaller and smaller in size. That's a direct effect of the selective pressure exerted by fishing in humans. Now, I want you to remember though, that natural selection does not create new traits, but really edits or selects for traits that are already present in the population. So this is very, very crucial. And it is the local environment that determines which traits will be selected for or selected against in any specific population. The other thing I would like to um, you to pay attention to, and we've already talked about this a lot in both unit five and unit six, is that phenotype can be the product of genotype, but it can also be a product of environmental influences. So evolution can only act on phenotype that is the product of inherited genotype. Okay, so natural selection can only act on 
phenotypic variation that is a genetic component. So um, remember we talked about these caterpillars in one of our, um, I think it was in unit uh, five or six, the caterpillars that are based on, uh, raised on a diet of flowers are gonna have this appearance, right? Because um, they look like the flowers of the oak tree and the caterpillars that are raised on a diet that are born later uh, during the summer and are raised on a diet of uh, oak leaves are gonna look like this and they're gonna blend with the tree branches. Now, these phenotypic differences are not due to differences in genotype. The, this is basically the environment having an effect on um, the phenotype due to changes in gene expression. Natural selection cannot act on these two phenotypic differences because they're not heritable differences. They're the effect of the environment on the phenotype. So I just like you to remember that. And we're gonna end here and we're gonna talk, next time we're gonna talk about microevolution. Okay, see you next time.